First reading comes from Revelation chapter 1. <clears throat> the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves and has freed us from all our sin by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Peregrim, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as so dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and Hades. This is God's word. <clears throat> Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. The glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The second reading comes from Revelation chapter 14. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. 
This is God's word. When we confess that we believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, what does it mean? It means that I believe that on the last day, God will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. The third reading comes from Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic art, the idolaters, and all liars, They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are the healing of the nation. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their forehead. There will be no more night. They will not need the lamp, light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophet, sent his angel to show his servant the things that must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the word of the prophecy written in this scroll. This is God's word. Jesus, we gather around your throne. We are your people whom you have redeemed by your blood. We pray that you would stir up our hearts and minds to live as your people now and then. In your name, amen. Please be seated.
So what will happen one minute after you die? It's kind of unnerving to think about it, and yet absolutely every person here will face that question for themselves. So, what will happen? Will angels whisk you away to paradise, or will demons drag you down to the pits of hell? What? Wait, what? Well, check the guest list. Uh, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the murderers, the vile, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. Ever told a lie? They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And this list is not all sins and sinners, of course. It's just a sample to give a representative of the whole. So, who's going to make it? When you look at that list, you realize, okay, there's some bad stuff up there, but still, uh, if you think too hard, we, you realize, well, wait, I'm up there too. In some way, maybe not all these sins, but some of them, and if not them, others. So, yeah. So, well, the only difference between one person on this earth and the next, the only difference between you and them is that in the end, they did not have a new life born within from above, in which the sacrifice of Jesus has covered all of their sin. They did not have a life in which they listened to the voice of the Good Shepherd and followed by a God-given faith. But there, there you have it. Short sermon, what will happen one minute after you die, the judgment. Okay, and how will it go for you? Have no fear, for you are living by grace. You have been saved by grace and through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. You have been given by the Holy Spirit a faith that truly believes that Jesus he is the one. For God so loved the world, <clears throat> He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. And this life that you have is a life which is now hidden in Christ with God. And when Christ, who is your life right now, when He returns at the end, you too will appear with Him in glory. It is as sure and certain as the resurrection of Jesus Himself. Your eternal hope, then, is not in your goodness, but in Jesus. It's not in trying hard to not make that previous list, but it is in the sacrifice of Christ for you. Your unshakable hope is that the God who is with you now, who dearly loves you and sings over you, delights in you, who has purified you from all sins. This God will be the one with whom you spend all eternity with then. And, and, with, and it's such a way that you rejoice as you do now to serve Him and love Him and even obey Him. This is the hope that every Christian has. And yet I have noticed that in myself, and as I've listened to many other people over the years, that the way we think about life after death is often like one thinks about winning the lottery. You know, we kind of have these, these fantasies and these daydreams, you know, like if you actually won the lottery, right? All the things you would do and you'd buy, and we kind of do that with eternal life and that a lot of our ideas of what life will be like are pretty much me having what I want, doing what I want with the people that I want, and, and God himself has very little to do with that picture rather than him being the center of everything. 
You know, like many of you, my, my uh, heavenly ideas are that I'm lying out on a beach and it's 78.6 degrees. Uh, there's about a four mile an hour breeze over the water onto the land. Sun is overhead, but it's not overbearing. And, and there's a whole smorgasbord of fruits over here. And, and the guy who makes the omelets in the mornings, oh man, he's so awesome. That kind of a thing, you know, and, and Jesus Oh, he's there, you know, but the fruit, woo you know. And then I've noticed that some people, they've got some, some big questions, like, like maybe, you know, this life after death, it's not going to live up to those fantasies and those ideas of what they thought heaven was going to be. Because, you know, if my dog's not going to be there, I don't know if I want to be there, you know. And is there going to be beer there and, and fishing and football, you know, the basics and and some people are very practical in their questions, and they, they just want to know, well, we're we going to recognize people. You know, people you've, you've known here, will we, will we know them there? And will we remember, you know, the life that we had here when we're there? You know, because either way, that's problematic. You know, if I don't remember the people that I love and the good things... I'd be sad, right? And, and then if I do remember everything, I'm going to remember everything. And I didn't always do everything well or right or good and I'm on that list. And won't that kind of haunt me for the rest of my eternity, you know? And that, that can't be good. And, and speaking of eternity, what are we going to do? That seems like a long time. Won't we get bored, you know? And, and what if you have a spouse? Are you going to be together forever? You know, that could be good and, or not. And, it, you know, what if you have more than one spouse? Which, ah. And then there's a serious question that I don't think any of us really want to think too long about. And that is, how could we ever truly be happy if not everyone's there? You know, if, how could you not be just completely devastated if one of your own loved ones was not with you, but in the fiery lake of sulfur while you're lounging on the beach. I mean, just, we can't really even consider that for long. Because when we do, when we think about this life after this life, we realize that it's so problematic that there's, there has to be some tears there. That there's no way avoiding it. There has to be some worries and some concerns, some frustrations and angers. And if nothing else, just survivor's guilt and, and perhaps even some real anger at God that He has not done all the things that you had hoped and that bringing all the people you really wanted to be there and they're not there. See, all of these questions really disturb us and, and how are we ever going to have an answer here without really knowing what's going on there? And yet, it really comes down to a set of three very primary questions. And once they've been answered, there can be some peace and hope. And the three questions go something like this. Well, is God love? Is He good? Does He have our best interests at heart and in mind? And will He do the best for us and our families? See, if we have these answered right, then the rest of it's going to fall into place. But before you land on an answer to these three questions, keep in mind that they, they're very similar to the types of questions that Adam and Eve faced as they stood before the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. Remember, that's how our series 12 weeks ago started, was in the Garden. And you remember how the serpent slithered in and, and posed some very similar questions. You know, did God really say? Can He be trusted? Is he good? Is he loving? Isn't he withholding? What kind of God would, would withhold something like this from you? And as they considered these questions before that tree, you know that they took and they ate the forbidden fruit and nothing from that point on went the way they expected. Their dreams and fantasies about winning big lost everything. Although they did gain exactly what was advertised, they now knew the good and the evil. And now death would come not only to them, but to all of their children. And not just death, but the second death in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That is the road that we are all on because of them. And is it simply because God was mad? You know, He's getting even. 
It has to do with his very nature of who he is and the reality of being good and love and doing what is best. For the reality of God's nature is that he is life itself. And apart from him, there is no life. There's only death, destruction, chaos. There is no third option, neutral option for us to exist. We are his creation. We don't create an existence apart from him. There's only life with him or death without him. And so we really cannot get an answer to any of these questions by thinking about heaven or hell. We must look for other evidence. And the evidence at hand is the entire book of the Scriptures. Because here, God presents to us His great rescue story of His beloved, you and me. Here is the historical account of the extent to which God would sacrifice and suffer that we might be with Him in life. It is there that we find Jesus who left life with His Father and entered into death with us. But in so doing, He opened the kingdom of God to everyone. No one is excluded. The vile, the idolaters, people who put something else in their heart other than God, all liars, the sexually immoral. Every sinner receives this invitation from the Good Shepherd to come And all who hear His voice and all who follow receive. You see, where we find the answer to whether God is good and love and He will do what's best, we look at the cross of Jesus and we see the goodness and the love and what is best for us. And now, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. For all who follow this shepherd, follow Him into life. As He has been raised, so shall we. And we shall see God. He's going to write His name on our foreheads. No, He doesn't get out a Sharpie and write on. He, it means we're going to be with Him. We're His own. We're His possession. We're His family. And did you catch the very end of that? And we shall reign with Him. See, what's going to happen a minute, an hour, or after you die? The judgment but then the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. We we get a flesh and blood body. We're not just going to be a spirit floating around up in heaven, but a new earth is coming in which we reign over it. John saw this and he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth, they went away. I heard a loud voice from the throne cry out, Now the dwelling of God is with people. He will be with them and they will be His people and He will dwell with them. And God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more mourning or crying or death or mourning or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything everything new. So all of our questions of what will happen one minute after we die, they are answered in the goodness of God. From the silly to the serious. And we find there that our hearts will be completely satisfied with that answer so that even now we can have peace and comfort to know that what I don't know now I will be at peace with then, for my tears will be dried. There will be no more mourning or crying or this old order where the ache in my heart to be loved and accepted and valued is fulfilled in full. Because the God who gave himself into death will lead us to a place where there is no more curse. And it's not just for us, us who've just been gathered here in this stormy day. But God desires that all people, He desires that no one be lost, and so He's placed His church on earth. That's you and me. Until He comes again, our mission is to proclaim the Good Shepherd's news that the the river of life is available. Come and drink. Anyone may come and live. So let us go forth with Him who was, who is, and who will to come. Go forth in the peace and the joy of the Lord, proclaiming this good news until He comes again. Amen.
Oh, yeah. 